Good morning, everyone. We are very excited today to have Dave Birch, who, um, whose, whose name really kind of introduces him. Um, it's, he's, a, he's a technologist. Um, he's been involved in the technology space um, for many years. He's a thought leader in terms of the future of technology and the future of money, and we'll explore more of that in detail. Um, and he's always very kindly been a supporter of the Digital Pound Foundation and our work exploring new forms of digital money and their potential social and economic impacts as well. So Dave, I'm very excited to have you here, as you can see. Um, can we start with, with a little bit of an introduction to yourself for the few people who might not know who you are? <laughs> What's the history of Dave Birch? Uh, well, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, Nana. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, a, quick, a sort, of, sort of potted history is I started off um, in uh, communications and um, I did a lot of work in secure my, my field was like secure and reliable communication so I worked for um, you know NATO and, and the military and various things and had the opportunity to live and work in a few different places the Far East North America in Europe and then it just happened that when some friends of mine asked me if I would be interested in joining a, a a, a startup which was which was what became consult hyperion it happened that the things that i knew about from the defense side um suddenly became interesting in financial services because you know along came you know networks and the internet and the big bang and and all of a sudden organizations needed to be able to communicate securely across more open networks and so that sort of took me into that area. I worked at the stock exchange and and um, so on. Uh, and from that went into that then went into banks and that went then went into payments. And at that time, smart cards were new and we were looking at transitioning to EMV. And that was all very interesting. So I did a lot of work in that kind of area and then got involved in one of the very early in fact probably one of the first attempts to create what we would now think of as a central bank digital currency which was mondex um and i and i became very fascinated by the idea of um electronic cash and how you would work out what it needed to do and how it should work obviously for one reason or another that never really took off um but then we got involved in M-Pesa down in Kenya, which, you know, in fact, a, a very small feather in Consult Hyperion's cap is that they did the original feasibility study for M-Pesa. And that um, became one of the most successful fintechs ever. And so I became very interested in, OK, so clearly it's not the technology uh, alone that makes these things successful. It's also to do with the kind of regulatory framework and business and stuff like that. Uh, and the more time I spent looking at that, the more I became convinced that a lot of the things that we saw as problems in the finance side, on the payment side, were actually really identity problems. They weren't really payments problems. They were problems that came about because nobody knew who anybody was. And so I got, I got a bit... <laughs> I got a bit focused on this whole kind of digital identity issue. Thanks to the good graces of um, Diane Coyle, Dame Diane Coyle, who was starting a publishing house at the time. I was encouraged to write my first book about this, which was Identity is the New Money. That turned out to be, turned out to be um, successful, which was great. Um, but it also turned out to be quite influential and um, basically that sort of changed the path of my career and I <clears throat> since all the people I'd hired as consultants were better consultants than I was I thought it was better to focus on uh, writing and developing these new narratives and so and then of course you know I got old and I'm on some boards and advisory boards you know the sort of thing that old men do so I still do a little bit of consulting work I'm still a global ambassador for Consult Hyperion um, but I spend more of my time writing and uh, getting involved in other things at the moment. And technology has been, you know, a constant theme through, yeah. throughout your career. Um, you, you, um, as we've discussed before, we're, we're both ex 
avid and extensive science fiction readers. Um, and, and, you know, one, one of the great things about science fiction is it allows us to explore how technology will impact our lives in the future. Um, and how, you know, how do you think that technology has shaped the development of society and continues to shape the development of society? We've talked about, you know, the, the emergence of media studies and things like that and how this is aligned with the ability to propagate information faster. And, and these are all sort of fascinating areas and how technology is, is changing fundamentally the way that, that humans engage with each other and how we organize ourselves going forwards as well. I think that uh, insofar as it relates to money, you know, you could broadly categorize the technology eras as, um, and this is a little bit pat, but you'll get the point. <clears throat> you know, money was atoms, gold and, you know, whatever. And then, um, then there was an interesting century. So uh, money was atoms, but then people invented the telegraph. And fairly soon thereafter, money became bits about atoms and started to move around all over the place. And then rather famously in cryptocurrency circles, you hear about this all the time. In 1972, the United States ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And so money just became bits. So if you just want like a super high level version of it, it was atoms. Actually, more than that, it was atoms about atoms, of course, because you had checks and banknotes and things like that, but they were still atoms. <coughs> they were just atoms about other atoms. Then we had this kind of hundred year period where money was bits about atoms. And then it just became bits. And actually, it's rather interesting. I, I remember going to, th I, I think it was at Rusi, but I can't remember. I remember going to a thing a few years ago when I was asked to come and talk about electronic cash to a non um, to a non-technical audience, you know, and, and I was learning how to try to communicate better with, um, and there was a, a journalist, a bit educated, intelligent journalist from one of the national newspapers who asked a question which made it clear that they thought that five pound notes were still backed by bank, uh, by gold in the Bank of England, which hasn't been true since I think 1932. I meet a lot of these people every day. So, so, yeah, so we, we had that brief hundred year interlude where that was true. Um, but that still is how people think about money um, rather than thinking about it as just bits. If you connect that with, I guess, what you'd probably think of as the prevailing paradigms about money. Uh, again, I mean, we were talking about this at a very kind of superficial level, but the uh, the sort of barter theory of money, you know, the double coincidence of wants and, you know, we used to swap my eggs for your milk and so on. And then we couldn't. And then as things got bigger, we couldn't always find people to swap things with. So we needed money as the intermediary, which I think was the sort of accepted view of it. Um, but I think now most people, at least most people I talk with, are more persuaded by the debt theory of money, which is that money began as debts, as obligations. Um, <clears throat> and the the sort of digitization of those obligations is is where we're going. So we use money as a kind of intermediary for that sort of thing. Um, but if you apply the technology and that thinking and of course what you just mentioned which is the connectivity and all this sort of thing you put all these kind of things together i think you do end up with a really different version of money and it may and I, it makes me laugh because i i watched um i'm not a big star wars fan at all but um i was watching a star wars thing with my son who uh, one of the derivative series they have on um netflix or something <laughs> and uh and it's funny because you know there's a there's the guy who's like the warlord who's taken over some planets somewhere and uh and one of the one of the um planets comes to pay him tribute and they come to his grand court on planet whatever it is in the year three million um and they turn up with a chest and open it up and pour out coins i'm thinking i you know if you were paying tribute to somebody alpha centauri right now you wouldn't be using it you know you you wouldn't use coins never mind the year three million Go and try and pay your council tax with coins and, and see how far you get. You know, so they, it's funny how like they can imagine 
you know, things going faster than light and anti-gravity and, uh, you know, alien races. But they can't imagine paying for something other than with coins, which seems odd to me. So that can't be the future of money. Uh, by the way, I'm being mean about Star Wars because I don't really like it. But I think the Star Trek vision of the future, um, which people tell me is that there's no money, because Star Trek is a sort of 1960s hippie fantasy about the future. It's, it's a world of post-scarcity abundance. Because it's a world, it's we a world have of replicators and yeah. we have infinite sources of energy. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's a post-scarcity world. But the, you know, the idea that anything is post-scarcity seems, odd. you know, things will always be scarce. You know, whether it's that house on the beachfront in Brighton or your attention span or, you know, a seat at the FA Cup final. I mean, there are always things that are going to be scarce. Um, they're using post-scarcity in a, in a, in a, and also, of course, it's not quite true because there is one. The thing. Exactly. There's one yeah. thing that you can't put through the replicator, which as everybody knows is gold pressed latinum. And which is why gold pressed latinum is used as money by the very thinly disguised anti-Semitic stereotypes of the Ferengi who are the sort of merchants mm. uh, and traders in and all this sort of thing. So neither of those visions can be right. <clears throat> so the question is, if we're just thinking about a world of bits, ultimately, what does it look like? Does it look like uh, a digitization of what we have now in the short term, possibly, but in the long term, not obviously? Does it look like uh, some alternative, like uh, Bitcoin or something like that? Again, it's not obvious to me that that's true in the long term. <clears throat> in the long term, it's actually not obvious that you need money at all. Because if you have this debt theory, you know, <clears throat> in a world where everything's connected to everything else, so that the mutual cross obligations are constantly known, you, you don't need to cash out, if you see what I mean. Um, mm. And the, the way people quite often... And it's a useful story to think about. I mean, you must have heard lazy management consultants use this story a thousand times at conferences when they couldn't be bothered to prepare any notes. But you remember the thing about the stone money in the Pacific and the, you know, those, those giant stones that were used as money on the, oh, well. Hello, go on, do go it's on. A, it's a, well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting example. So, so, um, so basically <clears throat> in, in, um, on, you know, the island, it's Yap is the, is the, um, so money was huge pieces of stone. But the reason these huge pieces of stone were money is because they were stone that came from another island. You couldn't get it on this island. Mm -hmm. So there was scarcity. So they would go to the other island and get these big pieces of stone. I and mean, you can see lovely pictures of them online, these big kind of giant, giant stone wheels, you know. I mean, these things weighed tons, you know. So I'm the chief. Uh, so somebody gives me tribute. They give me this giant stone, which I can't actually move. Uh, my daughter gets married to somebody, so I need to give a dowry. I mean, apologise for the kind of sexist, you know, use of the, but it's you know, it's a real world anthropology. So, uh, so I give somebody else the big, but of course the big stone is too big for any of us to move. So the big stone just stays outside my house. But everybody remembers, the consensus is that the stone belongs to you, not me. The stone actually never moves; it just stays. That consensus worked even in circumstances where neither of us could actually see the stones. So. Sometimes, you know, when they were getting these stones, sometimes there'd be a storm or bad weather and the boat would sink or they'd chuck the stone over the side to stop the boat from sinking. So the giant stone is now five miles down at the bottom of the Pacific, but it's still my stone. So when I give it to, to as a dowry, everybody knows it's now your stone. The fact that neither of us have ever seen the stone doesn't make any difference. The consensus tells us who it belongs to, mm. which is a rather interesting analogy to be. I, I can see where this is going. So, is that the future? Well, the thing is, why would you need that if 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 you know all the time whose obligations are to whom, you don't need to convert those obligations into an intermediary. You only need that intermediary if you don't have the full information. In an online world, you have the full information. And it sounds rather odd to say, well, look, <clears throat> I'll do some work for you. And when I finish doing the work for you, I offer you uh some tins of paint uh, a weekend at butlins uh, a couple of gold coins and you know whatever else and you like 
Okay, that sounds. I don't want that. I don't want to go to Butlins. You know, what have you else have you got? And oh, I've got these books. You know, that sounds mad when it's you and me talking about. But when you're talking about digital assets being traded continuously online in a liquid market where their value can come, it's nothing. That's 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 your bot and my bot in a couple of nanoseconds collecting and trading away obligations until we settle out what we're happy with. Mm. You know. So, but how do we value those obligations? Isn't there still? I, I think this is going back to the barter versus credit theories of money. And for maybe those listeners who aren't so well acquainted with those, you know, competing theories, you could go into a little more detail about them. Well, I think you know the <clears throat> the, the reasoning. I think um, it's it's. Um, I mean, like a great many other people, I think the book that changed my mind on this was David Graeber's Debt. So he's he's sadly um, deceased now. But as he pointed out in, in that, you know, the earliest versions of money that we have are not coins and notes and intermediaries. They're debts. They're debts to temples. They're debts between groups of people. They're obligations for future and these things were clear and these things showed up on clay tablets, which is how can we know what they are? <clears throat> and they got traded. I can give you a very simple example to illustrate. Um, so. And everybody's familiar with this example. So after the Norman invasion, <clears throat> you remember when William the Bastards illegal invasion and genocidal regime change took place in 1066. The. The way that taxes were paid was using a thing called tally sticks. That's why we still use the word tallying up to mean counting up. And you needed a, you needed a technology that would work with an illiterate population. So basically what they would do is get a stick. So you're the sheriff of Nottingham and I'm the king, right? So we get a stick. We cut some notches in the stick to represent pounds and shillings and pence, like how much money you owe me. <clears throat> for the next in fact these would pay twice a year so the next six months and then we split the stick down the middle and we keep half each so when you show up with your taxes in six months time we can put the two halves of the stick together and see oh right you you can't forge your half of the stick to pay less tax because it won't match up with my half of the stick when it turns up it's actually a very clever technology and it was very robust those sticks still exist you can go to the british museum and see them so, in fact, the British being a somewhat conservative people, um, <laughs> I mean, it's an odd sort of story, but basically hundreds of years after the invention of printing uh, and the invention of double entry bookkeeping, which we clearly regarded as sort of suspicious foreign inventions and we weren't sure how they were going to pan out, we actually carried on using the tally sticks. And eventually, when we decided to stop using them, um, there was a, a there was a lovely English compromise, which was um, okay. We'll give this paper stuff a try, but we'll keep the tally sticks in store in case the whole paper thing doesn't work out. So they stored them in the Houses of Parliament, um, and in 1834 they decided finally they didn't need these anymore. So they set they put them in the boilers to set fire to them, which started a fire that burned down the whole Houses of Parliament. So that famous painting by Turner of Parliament burning when you're going across the bridge, that was because they were burning the tally sticks and it all got out of control and burnt down the medieval palace, which is why Parliament is now this Victorian Gothic pile instead of the original. Right. Uh, it's a lovely metaphorical story about what changes in money do to, to power. So, so but the point is, you had these sticks. And pretty soon, because it was the nature of these things, um, kings quite often didn't want to wait six months to get the money because they wanted to invade Scotland or some other thing like that. So they would sell their half of the stick to merchants. And when the taxes fell due, the merchant would present the stick and the sheriff of Nottingham would give the taxes to the merchant instead of to the king. The person who holds the stick, the other half of the stick, gets the money. Um, and obviously kings the, the, at that time because it was against theological frameworks to borrow money at interest. Um, the kings weren't allowed to borrow money and pay interest. So what they would do is sell the sticks at a discount. 
which mm. you and I know. <laughs> Early the, debt factoring. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so, but God wasn't very good at economics. So God didn't catch on. The fact that selling the stick at a discount was the same as borrowing money and paying interest went straight past God. He didn't notice this at all. So this worked perfectly. And of course, to the merchants, carrying these sticks around was much better than carrying around huge bags of gold and silver and specie and other sort of things. So these began to trade very widely. And um, and it's interesting, of course, those discounts varied in space and time. In other words, they varied because of the limits of communication. So sticks that would fall due earlier were worth more than sticks that would fall due later. <clears throat> and sticks that would fall due for taxes close to you were worth more to you than sticks that would fall. So, so in other words, if I live in Bristol, mm -hmm. a stick for the taxes from Somerset is worth more than the stick for the taxes from West Lothian because it's easier for me to collect it and pick it up. Mm. But the, so the, the, within a hundred years after the Norman invasion, you had a fully functioning secondary market and government debt in London. Yeah, the, the kind of regulatory geek in me is trying to work out if this is more similar to the yield on a, a government bond type thing or it, whether it's more like, you know, debt or invoice factoring, really. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of early hack of the two that it, regulatory lawyers at the time would have had a field day with had they existed, no doubt. But now, but now you imagine the same kind of system in a world of perfect instantaneous communication where the value of all of those can instantly be computed. You don't need to sell the stick to get cash to pay other people in cash because you can pay other people with the stick or more to the point, you can pay other people with fractions of the stick. I was at the Financial Times Crypto Digital Assets Conference, um, whenever it was, I can't remember. Last, it was the, it was the day, day, day before. I was there too. And, um, and um, oh, I'm, I'm embarrassed I can't remember her name because she was brilliant. The woman from Algorand Foundation, um, she made the point, which is an extremely accurate point. She said, look, in, now imagine those in a digital world. So you've got a money market fund and you can take slices of that fund as tokens and trade them out on. Well, those are money. Slices of those funds are functionally equivalent to money. There's no need to sell the fund to get the cash to pay for your builder. You just give the builder the tokens, which are the slices in your fund. And if his bot, because since it won't be him that's dealing with it, if his bot doesn't want those, it'll trade them away to get something it does want. So, so you would never bother converting them out into money. So when you're asking about, I don't think science fiction, in fact, I mean, I know this is a bit of name dropping, but I once had the opportunity to, to speak at an event with with Bruce Sterling, who is a fabulous science fiction writer. And um, at the dinner, and I asked him, you know, how come people don't write more about money? Like people have these amazing visions of the future in terms of the technology, but not for the technology of money. Why don't they write more about money? And he said, because it's boring, <laughs> which, is, which is a straightforward and honest. Um, but it's true, you know, in a lot of science fiction, the visions of money are either absent, like in Star Trek, and I think, was it, I'm sure I read somewhere, I think it may have been Brian Aldiss who said the reason why there's no kind of focus on the economics in, you know, Lord of the Rings or Star Trek is because they were written for teenage boys and the one thing teenage boys don't have is money. So, you know, it's... My, uh, my son actually asked me a very interesting question, having watched all of the ex extended editions of the Lord of the Rings movies over the last few weeks. And he's eight and a half, and obviously the half is very important there. Um, but he asked me why the or orcs work for Sauron, because he said that like maybe they just like beating people up and being mean to people. But there's only so much you can get out of that. Like after a while, you get tired, so or bored. So why do the orcs work for Sauron? And I said that is a very good question, actually. But, but or orcs were made to beat people up and not get bored with it aren't they? I mean, orcs are... They're, they're inherently... They've been yeah. bred for it, you know? So yeah. We shouldn't be mean to them. No, we shouldn't. Um, but anyway, we anyway, so the, so go the point down is, a Lord of the Rings rabbit hole here. <laughs> but moving on slightly... The point talking... is, if you talk about the long-term vision of money... Yes. 
I think the long term vision of money is that money basically disappears. We just don't have it anymore. What we have is continuous markets of of tokens, digital asset tokens. That are continuously valued against each other, but also against their desirability by individuals. Well, you, you asked interestingly, what would be the benchmark? <laughs> yeah, so in, like if you so have neutrally value them to say, like, to what extent is a weekend at Butlins worth my labor for the next right, right. three days? And can I trade this on the market for something that I would like? You, don't you need some sort of common measure of, you know, value across that? Well, right now, I mean, right now, if we go on Amazon and look at different pages, we'll we'll see different prices for things, right? Because it's smart enough to know that I'm less price sensitive on some things and more price sensitive on other things. And you and I wouldn't be the same on the things that we're price sensitive on. So, so an intelligence system would already price things differently. I mean, you see this all the time when you're trying to buy an air ticket and you're talking to a friend on the phone about which flight you're looking at and they're seeing a different price to what you're mm -hmm. seeing, you know. So, so I think the idea, but the, yes, you're right. I mean, there, there's some kind of benchmark, but the thing is, would the benchmark be something other artificial like the dollar? Or in the future, would the benchmark become something more universal? I mean, did, I don't know if dollars mean anything on Alpha Centauri. Whereas... No, I mean, you could have any you could have any arbitrary thing that just conveys value across well, networks or something. I like wouldn't that, say, right? I mean, because suppose that, I mean, I've, I've had discussions with different people who have different views about this. And I, I, I'm honestly, I, I don't know what the answer is. But you could imagine that, maybe energy would be a good benchmark you need certain amounts of energy to do things or yeah you know i i don't know um but then anyway, you're talking about the far future now you're not talking about the the near future i like the energy one because that's actually how you could build sustainability into the financial system of the future is uh, and and into the economy of the future is by determining the amount of energy required for it and perhaps also the source of that energy but yes if we're looking very very far future then that all changes significantly because we will have different sources of energy um entirely and and potentially one day you know and it, well, you would have energy which you can use for things, staying alive and flying around mm. the galaxy and all sort of thing. And then, and that's in contrast to dark energy that you can't use. And the dark energy is alien races that have already discovered Bitcoin and realize that unless you control 51% of the energy in the known universe, you're, you're liable <laughs> to attack. So, so basically, in time, most of the universe's energy disappears into Bitcoin mining. And what's left over is the energy that we can use for going to Butlins and doing other, doing other things. Doing the other mundane things. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can prove there. that with a spreadsheet, but it's as good as anything I hear at most Bitcoin conferences. So, so let's talk about, you know, the near future of money. So we've talked about the far future. Um, now, now coming back to say, you know, our outlook for the next by 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I liked your, you know, your, your earlier description of, you know, we had money in atoms and then that's moved into, you know, money over wires and things and dematerialized form. And I think that really succinctly um, covers the, you know, the fact that um, money is constantly evolving in the form that it takes <laughs> and potentially then the fact that it takes as well and you know one thing we say often at the digital pound foundation is that in the future um you know the different currencies um, different global currencies will or different jurisdictions currencies will compete on the global stage not only against you know what how currencies compete today which is the um the counterparty risk, the creditworthiness of the, the issuing sovereign nation um, or its banking system, but instead on the functionality that it offers in the future. And what are some of these kind of functional benefits that, that money can um, evolve to have um, within, within our you know, lifetimes? I mean, to answer that question in two parts, I mean... I mean, broadly speaking, in the kind of foreseeable short term, I tend to think, as I think a lot of other people do, that uh, we're moving into an era of digital assets and tokenization and DeFi. And within that framework, 
um, stable coins, fiat stable coins, um, have a really big role to play. Because when you look around the world at the moment, uh, it seems to me pretty clear that, I mean, I was arguing with somebody about Argentina a couple of days ago, because it was in the news a couple of days ago. Argentina is, you know, has the biggest hoard of US dollars outside the US, you know. So when, when people talk about, oh, well, look, um, people in people in Argentina want Bitcoin because they're fighting to free themselves from the yoke of capitalist tyranny and all this sort of thing. What they really want is dollars. And cryptocurrency is just a way of getting dollars. <clears throat> most people in most of the world, most of the time, actually want dollars. And so, you know. So the question is, what other uh, currencies could you imagine in that situation? I mean, we're all familiar with the digital one and the Belt and Road, and you know, in certain parts of the world, that could become uh, a bigger part. Uh, although there's, I mean, there's, I mean remember, you, making the currency desirable isn't just about making a nice token that's easy to trade. It's also about having the right legal system and financial system and all this sort of thing. So it's not as simple as just uh, doing that. But you could imagine. I mean, one of the examples I used in my book was Canada. You know, it was like because Canada. It's very privacy focused. They're always going on about privacy in Canada. So, you know, you could imagine, suppose there was a Canadian dollar, um, pretty much like the US dollar, similar kind of token. You could, But it had some degree of privacy that the US dollar didn't have. There might be lots of people who would prefer to use the Canadian dollar for that reason. Um, or alternative, then there might be lots of people who prefer um, authoritarian regimes and would decide, well, it's safer to use a currency where the benign, all-seeing eye of the dictator ensures that the money is only used for reasonable purposes, and therefore I will use, you know, whatever, you know, some other kind of currency. So, and it, actually, you see, you see already that, um, you know, when people talk about de-dollarization, it's true. If you look at the sort of gross figures, the the proportion of of dollar, you know, used in sort of global stuff like has gone down a bit over the last few years, but it's not been replaced by rubles and yuan and things like that. It's replaced by Swiss francs and Swedish kroner and, and these sort of things. So you can already see that that in a... But I just, I can't help feeling if you do the thought experiment and say, well, now what if there was a... What if there were digital currencies and everybody in the world had a wallet on their mobile phone and anybody could use any currency they wanted... I'll tell you right now, they'd be using dollars. They wouldn't be using Tanzanian shillings or rubles or they'd be using dollars. So having having fiat stable coins, in particular dollar stable coins, um, helps trade, which makes us all better off. And so as that trade migrates to being a trade in digital assets. And I think, you know, when we were talking about this before, I said, I think people are kind of underplaying the role of the metaverse in this as well, because... People played around with those Facebook bubble people with no legs. And they're like, you know, well, this sucks. So, you know, the metaverse. I, I have a feeling that they're wrong. You know, the, the next generation of consumers. You know, we think of kids as spending all their time doing the TikTok shoot yourself in the head challenge and mucking them out on YouTube. But actually, if you look at the kind of attention figures, they're already in the sort of proto metaverses of Minecraft and Roblox and for, I mean, that's where they go to hang out with their friends and do stuff. And so when you, when you start swirling all of these things together, you, you sort of get a short term picture of people using stable coins to exchange digital assets of one form or another. Then, it, you know, in the medium term, you probably see a wider range of digital assets being used as the intermediary, not just dollars, but other things as well. And then in the longer term, you see the intermediary disappearing and people just trade the digital assets uh, continuously. And by the way, that's not even something I thought of because, do you know, do you know who Edward de Bono is? He's, he's, yes, um, he's, he's the lateral thinking guy, right? And the hats, remember? And the hats, the, yes. The six when, when, you and I start, when you and I started in the city, you used to get sent on, I don't doubt, you used to get sent on the same training courses that I did where you had to sit around with different coloured hats and if you had the, I can't remember what it was now, it was the green hat, you were the entrepreneurial one and the red hat was you were an accountant. Nothing quite like a management consulting training course. Dave. No, I don't remember exactly. But that was, but anyway, yeah. I, in, I, the I, early, in the I early 90s, 
um, he wrote a pamphlet which had an incredible influence on me at the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation, the think tank which I absolutely loved and rather proudly ended up as a, a trustee of. And he wrote a pamphlet called The IBM Dollar and he said, uh, you know, because IBM was the, and he said, well, you know, if, if IBM just issued its own money, which is a, a claim on its future products and services, and every other company did the same thing, why wouldn't you just use those? Why would you change them into money? You'd just swap mm. these things all the time. And I remember reading it, and as I was re and this is in the early 90s, this is before the internet, you know, before the World Wide Web. And, and, and just as soon as I read it. seeing token drops. He was like, I don't know, you come across people now, you know, you mentioned McLuhan at the beginning, media studies. If you look back at some of McLuhan's stuff, which looked mad in 1960, it's unbelievably prescient. You know, this idea about the global village and continuous communication and what you think of as edge identity, reputational identity. So when De Bono wrote that, um, it must have seemed absolutely mad. But when I read it, I'm, oh, my God, you know, this is there's a technological inevitability mm -hmm. about this. I was and it's it's funny because, like, if you worked on the technology side of things, you could see how how communications and security were co-evolving and everything was getting connected mm -hmm. up. <clears throat> you could sort of see as soon as I read it, I was like, "Oh my god, I know he's right." You know, so mm. I, that's the, super the people been thinking about this for a while. You know, yeah, and that's super interesting. And I think one of the reasons why is because it's also about trust. Like right now, um, fiat money, money that's issued by a central bank or a commercial bank, money that's recognised by a central bank and you know issued under the purview of the central bank, is what we trust but if we were to trust corporates more than our banking system and have more faith in their in the value of their future products and services as you'd say then that's you know a scenario in which we would potentially use those sorts of you know tokens or, or coins um that edward de bono described well here's um, I mean, this is where I do think that the, the the technologies coming out of the cryptocurrency world do have something really to offer in that space, because because adding in the kind of transparency, the auditability of, you know, not not having to rely on auditors to tell you that um, this come. I, I remember many, many, I'll drop another name here, many, many years ago, um, I went to dinner with, um, as it happens, Nicholas Negroponte and, um, and John Perry Barlow. And um, there was a discussion there about it, uh, one of the things that was going on on the cypherpunks list at the moment was that discussion of open books accounting and the idea of and I was just very I was very convinced by that. You know, this idea that because you could and in fact, I had a call yesterday. I, I, I won't say who with, but I was on a call yesterday um, discussing um, fully homomorphic encryption in a in a particular context, but this idea that I can look at your assets and liabilities and can, I can compute that your assets exceed your liabilities without knowing what any of those assets or liabilities are mm -hmm. is really rather interesting. And I think you know some of our uh, and they are Victorian notions of accounting and audit and so on possibly you know need revising in that sort of mm. future so so actually you say about trust in those kind of things it is interesting to imagine a system where you you trust in the tokens and the mathematics and the cryptography rather than um ey or price waterhouse or some other intermediary mm. but i i again I, I don't know where that's going to end up but you can see how those things are forming a kind of new proto universe of financial market infrastructure mm -hmm. something something new is coalescing there and i know we're um you know a little bit pressed for time now but i just wanted to end on one um you know particular question with you dave and this is not a place that i would normally go with um, a pound cast <laughs> interviewee but what are your what are your thoughts on bitcoin I, I I I am still unconvinced um, by Bitcoin. I I I think the technology fascinates me. If I was being unkind to fanatical people at Bitcoin rallies who who are quite annoying sometimes, I would say you know, perhaps it's a bit like COVID. You know, it's a, it's a laboratory experiment that escaped and and caused chaos. 
um, but I'm not sure it really means anything in the long run. So the, the technology is very interesting and opens up a whole new class of technologies. <clears throat> but, you know, would you really, um, would you really see it as a long term? I mean, for a start, we don't know what will happen to it in the long term, because after the last blocks get mined and you have to go to, you have to basically go to fees to keep the system running. Um, you know, you have to wonder what's going to happen at that point. You don't know that, um, <laughs> it sounds insane, but you know, a highly motivated actor could in fact launch a 51% attack and destroy it. And somebody said the other day, yes, but you'd never be able to get away with any money. Well, that's not the point. I wouldn't be doing it to get away with the money. I'd be doing it to destroy the system. You know, I was teasing somebody the other day about the first quantum computer. They were saying, you know, there's a, we were watching an IBM presentation and the guy was talking about folding proteins or something or whatever it was they were going to do with their quantum computer when they got it working. I'm like, first thing I'd do with the quantum computer is nick all the bitcoins because there's about 13, 14 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin sitting in Satoshi wallets right now, which if you could get the keys, you could you could move that around. So I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And and I, I, I genuinely respect a lot of people in that space who are doing really innovative thinking, which makes me think in turn but i just i'm i'm just not convinced i'm i'm open to further argument and suggestion but i, I hate to be the misery is this like be, <clears throat> because i'm the only person who doesn't like harry potter it makes me feel like that i don't like harry I, potter i don't like either. harry potter either oh I, yeah we can talk about it later i don't Thank want you. to you know i don't want this to be the the end points of which people remember this podcast but yes that's one for a wider discussion but thank you so much for joining us today dave um it's been a really insightful discussion oh, you made it um, fun yeah thank you it, it was really fun it was a great start to a friday morning thanks dave mm -hmm.